This video is about Lab 10, which is creation of a stopwatch. If we take a look at the lab manual, we see that we have to use our RTL design process to create a stopwatch. The stopwatch should, should be displayed as a time, as an 8-bit binary number on our basis board's LEDs. When the <coughs> process starts, our initial time should be zero, and if a button is pressed, um, the start button, the counter will start counting, and uh, if the button is pressed again, we see that the button will stop counting. There also is a reset button we can press that will cause the time to return to zero. Looking at our RTL design process, we can look at the standard process or architecture that we've been talking about in class. We see that it's basically consisting of a controller along with a data path. We want to use this process design to implement our stopwatch. Step one is to capture the behavior. Um, a high-level state machine is, was given to us in our lab manual. We have our high-level state machine. We see that it consists of three states, S and it, S stop, and S run. We have two inputs, S and R, which are each one bit wide, and we have an output that is eight bits wide, labeled T. <clears throat> we know that for our <clears throat> RTL design process, that our output should always be stored, and so we have local storage T reg, which is also eight bits wide. Step 2A uh, is to create a data path. And so we want to take that HLSM and create a data path to carry out the data operations. And so we, we have a general model on the right. We see that, the, that our, um, our system, our stopwatch, is going to have a registered output. And it has two inputs, S and R. <clears throat> Looking at our data path components from our book, we've talked about all of these, and we can choose to use some of these. But alternatively, the lab manual tells us to use a specific product, a product uh, which is a counter, which makes our life really easy. And that counter is available to us in the ISE. Taking a look at that counter, it's a CB8RE, which is an 8-bit binary counter that has reset and enable capabilities. Uh, we know that we have one output that's needed, so we're going to use our output of our CB8RE as our T-Reg, and we have two inputs that are needed. We have clear and increment, uh, and we know that we can use the clear and the increment inputs. If we take a look at our symbol, we want to push into our symbol to find out what each of the inputs in our symbol do. We can do that by choosing symbol information. And we see that we have a table. We have R, C, E, and C, which are our inputs. We see how those work to change the outputs. R is our reset, and C, E is our count enable. <clears throat> we begin to, uh, well, we know that a counter is going to increment if C, E is high at the active edge of the clock. And so we can use those inputs, increment and clear, to control our counter, which is basically our data path. Taking a look at our HLSM on the left-hand side, we know that we have T-Reg um, is our output. And so those actions that we want to complete, having T-Reg be T-Reg plus 1, we can implement using our data path component, our counter, by setting increment high. And we know that we can clear it where uh, t reg is equal to 0 in s and it state. We can use our clear input into our r input of our counter. <clears throat> Likewise, the output of our counter, q7 through 0, can be our t reg output, our uh, t output, which is 8 bits wide. And so just using a general model, we have our data path de defined as CB8RE, and we can make a model of that as we see on the right-hand side, which was given to us in the lab manual. Okay. So the next step in our RTL design process is 2B, which is to connect the data path to a controller. 
We want to do that, and so we have our model, <clears throat> and we have our definition on the right-hand side. Our controller is going to consist of a finite state machine. Our outputs are going to be clear and increment. Our inputs are going to be S and R. And likewise, given to us in the manual, we see that we can connect our finite state machine to our data path. We also can define our outputs going into our, um, our system by SR clock and our outputs being T. Okay. Step 2C is to derive our controller's finite state machine. This is exactly what we did uh, for the first two chapters of the book. Um, and so we know exactly how to do that, just quickly going through the steps. <clears throat> we have, uh, first thing that we want to do is to change the names on our S HLSM to um, the names that we need for our finite state machine. We need clear and increment to be our outputs. We want to set clear equal to 1 when we're in S init, which will clear, <clears throat> um, set the output of the finite state machine. Um, called clear to be one, which will in turn cause the data path component, our counter clear to be asserted, which would cause our counter to be cleared to zero. <clears throat> Likewise, our increment is defined in our S, <clears throat> S run um, state in our finite state machine. And we see that increment being our output out of our finite state machine is indeed an input into our data path component. Okay. Taking our finite state machine defined in the previous, previous uh, slide, we have it shown here and we can make a state table just getting our information directly from our finite state machine or our controller design shown in the upper right. And so I've just basically recopied that into table format. <clears throat> and we know once we have that, that was the first step of designing our finite state machine. We know the second step is to determine how many flip-flops we need. Three states indicates that we need two flip-flops. And likewise, we can then encode. I've chosen to encode in binary. S init was encoded as 00. zero. S stop was encoded as 01. And S run was encoded as 10. <clears throat> I now have a complete state table of the encoding, and I can now make my equations. Just going down the columns, I have D1 and D0. I have redefined as next state 1 and next state 0. Likewise, I renamed Q1 and Q0 from the present state as state 1 and state 0. <clears throat> that being said, I now wrote equations for D1 or next state 1, D0, or next state 0, and also my output equations being for clear and increment. As far as implementation of these equations, you're just going to use combinational logic. Your choice, you can use a two-level and or circuit. You alternatively could use a more complex device. You could consider using MUXs for each of the equations. We have four equations, one for clear, one for increment, one for next state one, and one for next state two. We know that the um, combinational logic for next state one and next state two are just input into our state register design. Um, our state register design has two flip-flops. We have the outputs of our state register being fed into our combinational logic um, equations. Okay, so once we have our <clears throat> finite state machine designed, we have our data path designed, we can go ahead and have symbols for both of those. We can use those symbols in a stopwatch or a top-level schematic, <clears throat> and so create that. And that basically takes you through the first part of the lab. Task three is to create a new revised HLSM. We want to make some changes. I would recommend that you would go ahead and finish up with the first part, get the stopwatch as described in these slides working, and um, go ahead and run a, run a simulation and see that that works before you continue on. Anyway, that concludes this video.